Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillah. Wassalatu wassalamu ala Rasulillah. Jazakallah khair everybody for joining in for this uh, free webinar by al Balagh Academy. Um, as you would be aware, al Balagh um, has designed a series of 12 really important lectures. Um, these will be all delivered online um, and we'll be analyzing current and future projections of the coronavirus uh, or COVID-19 as we know it, um, mainly discussing it from the Islamic perspective. Um, it has recognized, it really affected everybody. And what we aim to do through this course is we'll cover issues um, related to the medical, psychological, and the spiritual perspectives. Um, of course, looking at the tips, the toolkits, and the guidance for all, including families uh, who are socially distancing. Uh, so it will be done over a week, over a period of two weeks. Um, and uh, inshallah, ta'ala, we'll start off the first lecture today. Uh, with uh, Dr. Adnan Ali. He's a medical director at SJ Healthcare Consultancy Limited UK. Uh, so, Bismillah, uh, Dr. Adnan Ali, uh, over to you. And uh, just one last thing uh, if you've got any questions uh, during the talk, uh, please feel free to uh, uh, send those questions uh, using the box, the question and answer box. Um, and inshallah, we'll have a dedicated half an hour um, at the very end of the talk, inshallah, uh, for question and answer as well. So you may want to post your questions before that, um, or you want to wait, or even if you want to, you can wait till the very end. So over to you, Dr. Adnan Ali. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Uh, thank you very much, everybody, for joining us this evening. I hadn't quite realized I was the first uh, speaker, but Jazakallah uh, here to uh, Al Balab Academy for inviting me to take part in this really, 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 really important. I cannot stress how important these lectures are. Um, I, I think it's touching home. About two, three weeks ago, we were at a stage where people were still wondering whether. Uh, coronavirus, how it was going to affect us. But I think, unfortunately, sadly, we are now experiencing this on a personal level. Um, one of the things, a story just from today, unfortunately, is that just, you know, people ringing me close, friends, even I don't know, who are saying that their parents or their relatives are uh, the, the categories for, you know, being ventilated, going in you are changing and it's becoming more and more difficult. So this is why this advice, isolation, staying at home and shielding is extremely important uh, to try and protect yourself and others from actually even catching this uh, disease in the first place, especially if you're at high risk. So inshallah, we'll spend the next uh, uh, few minutes talking through uh, the government advice, uh, why it's been brought in, a little bit of information about what is coronavirus and some of the symptoms that it can present with. And also I'd like to just take an opportunity just to uh, hopefully bust a few myths uh, around this disease as well, um, so that we, we will all take it absolutely seriously and inshallah take something away from here that will not only protect us, but also protect the, the community, stop us from spreading this disease to others and also protect our loved ones, inshallah, from catching it. So, um, so just uh, uh, an introduction in terms of what we're going to talk about. So we're going to go through what coronavirus is, some basic symptoms, what is social distancing and why it's important, and then uh, just go through the Public Health England guidance on staying at home, isolation, and importantly, shielding. Um, so my name is Dr. Adnan Ali, I'm a, a GP, uh, in High Wycombe, I'm a, a practicing GP, um, still work clinically in, in the past few weeks that has increased significantly. Uh, I was quite shocked actually at the, the amount of coronavirus type patients that we have actually got out there in the community as well. So it's definitely a disease that is here uh, and it's going to be here for a while I'm afraid um, and we really need to take it seriously. So coronavirus, uh, that picture is really uh, quite a uh, uh, Good description and the reason it's called a coronavirus is when you look at it under a microscope you see the virus and you can see these um, uh, the kind of red triangles they're meant to represent uh, what it looks like under a microscope and uh, they, they look like small crowns uh, and that's where the, the, the term corona so uh, comes from so it's, it's how it appears under uh, a microscope 
And one of the, there was a video going around early on where people were showing uh, bottles of uh, I don't know, Dettol and these other kind of germ killing uh, liquids. And on the reverse side, it would say kills, you know, 99.9% .9 of germs, including coronavirus. And people would say, well, you know, they're saying this is a new coronavirus. How come there's already these uh, disinfectants around that are killing this virus already? And there were these conspiracy theories coming around that actually this wasn't a new virus and we already know about it. It's truth. Coronavirus is not a new term. There are around seven coronaviruses already known to, to us as human beings. Uh, and they can cause anything from common cold to respiratory illness. What's different about this one, this is a new coronavirus, this is a, a virus that we have not experienced before, and it causes these quite significant uh, respiratory syndrome, uh, symptoms and a respiratory distress. And actually, you may have heard of SARS uh, a few years ago. You may have heard of MERS, which is Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome. That is also a coronavirus. That transfers from camels to human beings. Uh, SARS, again, was uh, a, a virus that transfers from animals uh, to humans and causes these respiratory syndromes. So we do know, we do know coronaviruses exist, but this type of coronavirus is a new virus uh, that has transferred over from the animal species into the human, uh, into the human species, which is why, as human beings, we don't have any immunity to this because we've never experienced this virus before. Therefore, we don't have any immunity or ability to fight it. And then, when the when we catch the virus, it then causes a range of symptoms. And then, once you've had the virus, the theory is you then develop an immunity to it. Um, so like I said, it lives in animal species and can jump to humans. And this coronavirus, they, the disease it causes, has been named COVID-19. So you may see these different terminologies. Uh, there's uh, the actual name of the virus itself, which is uh, along the lines of COV-2 SARS. And then there's the name of the actual disease. The bunch of symptoms is called COVID-19. So just to, just to help you, uh, and then people use these terminologies interchangeably. So they'll say it's uh, coronavirus or it's COVID-19 or COV-2 SARS. So the symptoms, there's mainly two, two main symptoms that people need to look out for. Um, the first one is any uh, sort of new continuous cough, which mainly it's a dry cough, but actually now the advice is any type of cough, uh, even a mild one, could potentially be coronavirus uh, and or uh, a fever. Uh, and initially the advice was a temperature over 37.8, but now the advice is that if you feel hot and you feel like you've got a fever, then that counts. That is your symptom. So cough on its own, uh, or a cough and a fever, or a fever on its own without a cough. You don't actually have to have them together. Those are the two main symptoms. The research done in China early on, uh, this was uh, done on sort of 50 odd thousand patients, uh, shows there's a wide variety of symptoms, with fever being one of the most significant ones, a dry cough, fatigue, uh, you can get some sputum production, people feeling short of breath. Uh, and then you've also got things like the joint pain, sore throat, headaches, chills, etc. The difficulty is that these symptoms also mimic uh, symptoms, can be the symptoms of a common cold. They can also be symptoms of flu, which is why it makes it really difficult to diagnose uh, and to decide whether somebody has got coronavirus or not. Uh, the problem is we cannot test absolutely everybody uh, when they get these types of symptoms. Therefore, the advice is if you get these types of symptoms, it doesn't matter whether you've had any travel, whether you've come across anybody with coronavirus, uh, you need to assume that you have got it. Uh, and then you need, then need to follow uh, the advice on isolation, which we'll go into later. Um, so... Uh, and I'll, I'm, I'm more than happy to share these slides, by the way, later on, if people want these. Um, the other problem with coronavirus, the other difficulty with it, 
uh, there's two. One is that uh, you can have you be carrying the coronavirus uh, and not have any symptoms. And the problem with that is that because you're not symptomatic, you could potentially be Yes, we're having some connection uh, issues with Dr. Adnan Ali. Um, hopefully, he will be able to join us soon. Um, uh, there's a wide range and a time different symptoms can present. So typically, obviously, people present with either the fever uh, or cough uh, and the kind of fatigue. And that tends to be in the first kind of seven days or so. And a lot of people, a lot of people have just a mild illness. And by the end of the seven days, they tend to be getting better from their fever. Uh, their cough might go on for a few weeks, uh, but their, uh, the fatigue and short breath that tends to settle down. There's a certain uh, proportion of people, unfortunately, who, who then after about day seven, uh, tend to get this uh, reaction almost occurring where they then can uh, have further deterioration, further shortness of breath, and that can then lead to this acute respiratory distress, uh, which can then require, um, once they're in hospital, further intensive management. And that tends to be the picture. So for somebody being diagnosed, um, it's not that they're, you know, you've got coronavirus today, and, you know, within a few days, somebody will be really unwell and potentially in hospital. There can be quite a time lag between developing some mild symptoms, this kind of waxing and waning of uh, feeling better. Some people actually tend to uh, may even start feeling better by about day six, seven, and then suddenly have this deterioration as well. So it's a really difficult disease for us, um, for us medics to even uh, to predict what's going to happen with uh, with certain people, which is why the advice on shielding and isolation then becomes really important. So that just to summarise, you know, you've got the the time period when you could be carrying the virus and spreading it around, but also the time period when you've got the virus and you could then potentially have some further deterioration later on. So social distancing. Um, so it's about avoiding contact uh, with someone who is displaying symptoms, which is you know common sense. But actually, um, you know, if as you saw that whole bunch of symptoms, somebody could be suffering with the common cold. It could be having some flu symptoms. Uh, it could be a worsening of their asthma. It could be a sinus problem. There's a whole load of other medical problems that can cause similar symptoms. Um, and, and people may think, actually, you know what, it's okay, just because I've got, I've got a cough, it's my yearly cough. Actually, what the advice is now is that you, we need to completely avoid contact with those symptoms because they could be coronavirus. Um, so avoiding the non-essential use of public transport, obviously that's a, a closed environment and, uh, and you know, people um, at high risk of transmitting to one another. There's the encouragement of working from home where possible. So initially the advice came out that actually it should be, you know, uh, only essential workers need to be, should be going to work. But actually, no, the advice is, uh, and actually the interpretation uh, is that anybody who cannot work from home should still be going to work. So um, because of the, life is still ha still has to continue, people still need to earn a living. And there is a section later on, especially for self-employed people who, who might be working in, in trades and, and having to work in people's houses, etc. They can actually still do that as long as they follow certain rules and certain um, precautions that they're taking. And then the other thing, especially important for people in the Muslim community, in the Asian communities, uh, is the avoidance of large and small gatherings uh, and in public spaces, but also in our own houses. And this, you know, this is obviously touched home for us, uh, a very difficult situation 
um, in terms of suspending congregational prayers, suspending Juma prayers. But I think that was an absolutely correct thing to do uh, because even now we're seeing that actually such a high percentage of Asian and Muslim people who who are succumbing to or have succumbed to coronavirus because of the way we have our the, our community is so close knit, our communities have a, a massive sense of sharing and you know the the, the whole uh, culture of welcoming guests into our houses and going to a, there's a there's a lot of cultural issues there. And unfortunately, we've had to put a stop to it, but it's necessary to, to prevent this from spreading and to prevent it causing more harm to ourselves and others. So why is it important? This is a really good graphic. Um, I'm just going to try and pause it there. So um, if you, this just describes, um, just go back, sorry. Um, so... It just shows how um, if you have one uh, person spreading, uh, how at the end, so the theory is that one person, uh, I don't know if you can see my mouse on the screen, but uh, the, 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 the dots right on the left hand side of your screen is the first person, is one person who's got coronavirus. That one person uh, is theoretically could spread to around two, two and a half to three people. So if that one person goes about their normal life and spreads it to three people, um, those three people going about their normal life will spread it to three people or two and a half or two people each. Those people will then spread it to two and a half, three people each. And by the end of the month, one person after 30 days, you could have 400 new cases of uh, this uh, virus spreading around in the community. So you can see how exponentially it increases. However, by doing social distancing, so just by reducing our contacts even by a third, um, what happens is that you, you get this massive reduction because the knock on the domino effect stops. And, and it just requires a bunch of people to stop uh, meeting others or stop going out uh, and, um, and to socially distance themselves. So, so this one person only passed it to two, those two people only passed it to four, the next uh, four people only passed it to a few more. And what happens is you get this massive reduction uh, by the end of, uh, in terms of the transmission. And this is why social distancing is really, really important. Because what happens is if there's not enough people for that virus to then spread around, the virus can then no longer survive and therefore the virus then uh, disappears. And that is the theory. And I think we are seeing that. We've seen that in China. Uh, we've seen that very well in South Korea, where they were very um, uh, diligent in locking everything down. Uh, and then I think now, hopefully, inshallah, we'll see this here in the UK as well. Um, and, you know, our people who are continuing to socially isolate and socially distance themselves, following the guidance on staying home, if that continues, inshallah, I think we'll see that uh, it has a good effect and will reduce down the number of potential infections. So uh, it's just a really good uh, slide. Now, you may have seen other slides. There's um, uh, other examples where you've got matchsticks all lined up. Uh, and that, you know, a, a matchstick will pass on fire to another matchstick, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But if you take one matchstick out of there, you're breaking the chain. You're breaking the chain of transmission. And then it means that you're actually you might be stopping that infection going on to other people. So the current strategies that are, are being employed are the stay-at-home advice or the stay-at-home requirement, uh, isolation and shielding. And we'll just go through those very quickly. Uh, and isolation really is a complicated one. Uh, and unfortunately, there's a lot of wordy slides, but there is a, a good... Uh, diagram by the BBC which I've included which will hopefully help explain uh, the exact requirements for isolation. So um, staying at home means that only leaving the house for very limited purposes. So for instance shopping for basic necessities such as food and medicine. Um, only going out the house for a medical need 
uh, for example, if you had a, a, an appointment, um, actually most face-to-face -face appointments have actually been either cancelled or postponed. A lot of doctors and, and healthcare workers are now consulting by video or by telephone. But actually, there will still be people who need to be seen because there are still illnesses out there. There are still diseases that are still happening. So you may need to go for a medical need, uh, donating blood. Uh, a really important one, if anybody feels that at risk of harm or injury uh, or uh, you know, they're stuck in their house, uh, they can't, they're allowed to leave. They're allowed to go outside and seek help. Uh, or if you're going to provide care for, uh, you know, for a vulnerable person or helping a vulnerable person. The other reasons are to, uh, you know, taking one form of exercise. So you are allowed to go outside to a, uh, an open area. So it could just be actually your local, uh, your local, your local park uh, or just around your local neighbourhood. As long as people aren't crowding together, as long as people can keep that kind of two meter distance from other people, and as long as you're not going uh, in more than uh, sort of two people at a time, or if you're going as a household, so the people actually living inside your house, you can go out together, but otherwise no more than two people uh, at the same time. Or if, obviously, if you're traveling for work purposes and you can't work from home, uh, then that's another reason for leaving the house. And you can see why from that previous diagram, by putting these quite stringent kind of um, rules in, uh, people must have noticed how the roads are just very quiet. Um, and that imagine each one of those people has now broken the chain and that then allows the... Uh, uh, the, the virus to stop spreading to other people. And the risk is that, um, and this is why uh, you know, we have these behavioral insights as well. Uh, and personally as well, myself, you know, almost being three weeks, we've been sat at home. Um, it's very difficult. After three weeks of sitting at home, you just want to get out of the house. You want to go somewhere. Um, and But we must, really important that we continue uh, to uh, abide by this, and inshallah, you know this. It's it's we should be we should be staying at home also with the intention of receiving uh, the reward of patience uh, for staying at home and isolating ourselves because of this illness. And inshallah, that just adds a spiritual um, uh, angle to it as well. Inshallah. So. This is just a, a list of all the facilities. I think we're all pretty much aware. Uh, and, I, uh, uh, and obviously the one most importantly for us was places of worship uh, being, uh, uh, you know, gatherings in places of worship being pretty much banned, um, except for funerals. But, but for funerals, we, we must absolutely remember uh, in our uh, Muslim communities, um, it really should just be direct family and we really need to limit the numbers to five or ten people um, and people should feel uh, the um, the ability to to actually to tell others that you know this we, we shouldn't be gathering um, it's a very difficult time for the family um, obviously and and we all, we all feel extremely um, sad and sorry for them and upset for them. And we've all experienced and must have experienced it now. But, um, but you just have to hold yourself back and also uh, encourage other people to, to, to stay back as well. Uh, inshallah, at some point in the future, we will come out of this and things will come back to normal. But right now, it's really important, again, that we break that chain of transmission so no public gatherings except uh, where obviously people are living together. Um, uh, so you can, if you, you know, you're, you're a parent on your own and you've got your children with you, you know, you can obviously take your children and you need to go and do some essential shopping or, or whatever it is, then you can take your children with you um, if there's no option to leave them at home. Or 
uh, where the gathering is for essential work purposes. Again, that can happen, but it must be absolutely minimised. There should be processes in place to, to socially distance people, even in those environments. So you go to work, you can go to work for, uh, if you cannot work from home. Um, obviously, you can also still go as long as you're not showing any symptoms of coronavirus. And employees, and this is a, a duty on employers as well, uh, and especially, again, uh, you know, we need to take this information down to uh, the grassroots level. So our uh, Muslim uh, business owners, Muslim employers, uh, who may be, for instance, running a, a, a grocery store, um, they may not be quite aware that actually uh, they're it's not just the people who are coming into the shop to do the shopping that need to be mining and, and keeping the social distance and washing their hands frequently, but the employees also need to be given that opportunity. So where possible, uh, I would recommend, um, you know, that you know, we need to uh, dissipate this information out to our business owners and, you know, they may need to just separate out the areas in terms of, how far their tills are, for instance, if it's possible, and making sure they're providing um, uh, ways of stopping that transmission to their employees. I've noticed actually in some uh, in some chemists and even in some other stores that actually they've got these perspex sheets uh, in front of uh, in front of where the cashier is. And I know it, it, it removes that personal kind of touch, but actually, you know what? Right now. Uh, it's important that we try and spread uh, to try and stop the spread of these aerosol and airborne disease. Um, this is the advice for people who might be working in other people's homes. Um, you can go and work in somebody else's home, uh, provided that the trace person is well and has no symptoms. Uh, you need to make sure you maintain a two meter distance from, your, uh, from the other household occupants. I would suggest that you, uh, as a trade person, do some form of risk assessment. Uh, maybe you may even need to speak to your, uh, your, your personal or public liability uh, insurance people just to uh, make sure they're aware and they're happy for you to continue working. Obviously, no work should be done in a household where people are isolating or they're shielding unless it's absolutely essential. Um, and it goes without saying that if the person, the trace person is unwell, then they will need to isolate. They should, even if they've got very mild symptoms, they should be staying at home and not working. Um, and the police obviously has powers to enforce as well. So they can instruct you to go home. Uh, they can take steps to uh, stop children breaking the rules. Um, uh, and they can also issue uh, fixed penalty notices. And obviously this all, uh, there's a lot of, uh, in the press recently, about uh, what the level of police powers there, there are and should be. But uh, without this, uh, without this enforcement, then that chain would become difficult to break. And it just takes a few people to continue transmitting. And you can see how, uh, at the end of the month, how many extra cases there can be. So this is the, the complicated section, so I apologise, there's a lot of uh, detail slides in there, but there is a nice little summary slide. So this is the isolation advice for those people who um, are showing symptoms or living with people who are showing symptoms. And it's actually quite, it's, it's quite complicated. Um, and initially, uh, I... Um, Part of our household, we had to go into isolation, and me, even personally, as a, as a medic, reading through the guidance, so I was like, "Oh my God, this is really complicated." So that's where the initial kind of summary came from. Uh, so I hope you'll find this helpful. So the first important thing is that whatever, however mild your symptoms are, if you've got a cough, you've got a fever, you've got um, um, those two main things, or you're getting the short of breath, any other symptoms, you could potentially be potentially have coronavirus. Therefore, you need to stay at home if you're living alone for seven days from the onset of the symptoms. That's the easy bit. 
The complicated bit is if you're living with other people and we'll talk through that in a moment. So why is it important to stay at home? Well, as we said, you'll help uh, control the spread of the virus to your friends, to the wider community, and particularly the most vulnerable people in the community. Uh, and again, uh, you know, you are isolating. This is different to the stay at home advice. Uh, however, if you had absolutely nobody else to go and uh, uh, get you some medicine or shopping, you can obviously leave the house to go and do that. But really, the, the whole point of the isolation is that there should be no travel outside the house um, uh, at, at, when you're isolating. And, we should, and uh, alhamdulillah, we live in communities with a lot of support. But obviously, there are some people who may not have that support who are allowed to then go out and do that essential shopping. The 14-day period, um, we'll talk about in a second. So if you, um, uh, again, you're isolating, uh, schools are now closed anyway, uh, you shouldn't be going to any public areas should be going to work should absolutely not be using any public transport or uh, taxis you can however continue to exercise uh, as uh, again as long as you are keeping that um, distance from other people now um, I just want to touch back on the uh, the 14 days period for household so this is this is the complicated bit so uh, and actually, I think it'd be easier in a minute if I leave that and use the final slide. But really what it's about is the fact that you say, say a person develops symptoms of coronavirus. Now, as we mentioned before, it's possible that you may have had those symptoms. Um, uh, you may have been carrying coronavirus, but not showing the symptoms for a few days before you started to show and in those few days before, uh, there is then obviously that risk that you could have already have passed that um, on to other people, especially those people who are living in close proximity to you in your household. So this is why the household isolation advice came in, was that if one person in that household has got symptoms, then it's possible and likely that other people in that household who have not developed symptoms could have already caught coronavirus from that other person. Therefore, potentially, if they are outside the house, they could be passing it on to other people inadvertently. So that's why the 14-day advice, and the reason it's 14 days is because from research, from the evidence we've got from around the world, particularly from China, is that you can uh, be carrying coronavirus and not have any symptoms from any time period from naught all the way up to 14 and in, in some cases longer than that but the average is about 14 days so if um, somebody has got coronavirus in your household that person goes into isolation from that same day everybody else in that household it doesn't matter who they are what they do they must also go into isolation uh, into household isolation for 14 days from that time period. Now, there are some caveats that we'll talk about in a minute, but how do you then, what does that mean? So obviously you, you can't go outside, uh, you cannot use, even if you're not symptomatic, uh, you know, you, you, you can't go to the shops, you can't use public transport, etc. And I'm just trying to uh, uh, just emphasize the point that it's because you could be carrying and passing coronavirus around without any symptoms. So how can how, how can how can people stay at home? So um, you know we have alhamdulillah we have good community networks. Uh, you know ask your friends or relatives to help you with any shopping. Um, uh, try and order your medication online or by phone. Um, try and do your shopping online if it's possible. If there's any deliveries coming to you, and even actually this is this is quite common now then make sure you get the delivery driver just to leave uh, your packages or whatever it is outside your front door. They should not come into the home. Uh, if you're an employee uh, and you're unable to work, 
then you can actually, if you go onto uh, the NHS coronavirus uh, advice website, uh, you can actually download uh, an isolation note so you can complete your details online and then you can just uh, print this note off and you can give that to your employer. Uh, and then you can use that as your, um, your, your isolation sort of advice sick note almost uh, to, because to, uh, then you'll be entitled to uh, whatever benefits you may be. So, so there are, and I think the government has done a lot of work trying to help those in salaried and self-employed positions. And it's worthwhile having a look at the NHS websites because uh, there's a lot of information on there, especially the isolation notes. If you live with children, uh, again, they need to be isolated as well. Um, and they shouldn't be going outside. They can go to the garden again, but really shouldn't be leaving their house going elsewhere. And what we do know um, is that in the majority of cases, uh, children tend to have a very mild illness. Unfortunately, there, there will be cases, there are cases where children have very severe illnesses as well. Uh, but the advice is the same. You're looking for the same symptoms and the same isolation advice. So in particular, uh, we need to talk about vulnerable people. So these are people over 70 uh, or people under the age of 70 with a long-term condition. And actually the easiest way to remember that is if you're under 70 and you're invited to have a flu vaccine every year because you're an asthmatic or you've got diabetes or heart problems or whatever, then actually you, you kind of automatically fit into the long-term condition uh, and the vulnerable category. Uh, and also uh, women who are pregnant will be considered to be vulnerable. So if you're living with these people, so these are just a, 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 you know, a list of the common conditions, uh, but the easiest way to remember, or if you think, uh, you know, do I fit into one of these, is if you receive the flu vaccine or an invite then, or you're entitled to it, then you're probably in the vulnerable category. And then just at the bottom there, you've got people who are uh, uh, severely overweight BMI of 40 or more would also fit into the vulnerable category. So there's some specific advice for living with people who are vulnerable. Um, because again, uh, you say you were symptomatic and you had a vulnerable person living in your household who is not symptomatic, it's also possible that actually they haven't even caught it yet. So you want to still want to prevent them from catching it. So you want to minimize as much as possible the time uh, the vulnerable family members are spending in shared spaces, so that, you know, from kitchen, living rooms, etc. Uh, try and keep two metres away at all times. Um, encourage them to sleep in a different bed where possible. Try and use a separate bathroom. If you can't use a separate bathroom, then make sure uh, that the, the, the person with the symptoms uses the bathroom last. And also the bathroom is, you know, wiped clean, uh, after each time anybody uses it, try and uh, you know avoid using uh, uh, sharing towels and continue with the hand hygiene. Really important to continue washing your hands. Um, and then, in terms of cooking uh, in the kitchen, again, uh, avoid using it if there's a vulnerable person there. Uh, if you can, uh, you know, people uh, will need to, especially the vulnerable person, may need to eat on their own. The isolated person, again, uh, should be, uh, you know, taking their food back to their own room or how, um, however the family setup is. If you have a dishwasher, then use a dishwasher because the dishwasher will be washing, uh, cleaning the, uh, um, the, 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 the uh, crockery and the uh, cutlery at a much higher temperature. So a higher um, likelihood of killing the virus. Uh, obviously, if it's not possible, then make sure you use uh, washing up liquid. Uh, really important because the the soap and washing up liquid actually breaks down the fat around the virus and helps destroy it. Uh, and obviously, if uh, the vulnerable person is using their own cutlery that, uh, then or utensils, then make sure you use a separate tea towel to dry their things. There's some information here uh, for women who may be breastfeeding. Um, currently, there's no evidence to suggest that the virus can be transmitted uh, through the 
excess of milk. Obviously, it can still be transmitted because of that close contact, uh, but we do know uh, that children do get a much less severe illness. Uh, and we know that the benefits of breastfeeding outweigh uh, the potential risk of transmission through the breast milk. Um, obviously, if you're concerned, you should discuss that uh, with your midwife, health visitor, GP. Um, and, you know, if, if you're uh, living in a shared household, um, you know, make sure you're not sharing bottles, make sure you're sterilizing equipment properly, uh, make sure you're not sharing breast pumps, etc., because you want to try to reduce down the risk of that transmission. This is some information on cleaning. Uh, so you're absolutely okay to use normal household products to clean. Um, make sure uh, common surface areas are cleaned regularly. So door handles, rails, um, you know, you can just go around with um, you know, an alcohol wipe or whatever it is just to go around cleaning them, uh, I think on a regular basis. Um, make sure any tissues, et cetera, any personal waste, go straight into a, a bin. Um, that bag should then be um, uh, sort of fastened, tied in a knot, and then put into a separate bag. So you're double bagging your, your uh, personal waste from the person who is isolating. And then this waste should be kept separate from your household waste for 72 hours. And then after 72 hours, because that's the time that is considered uh, the virus, uh, you know, takes takes that long for the virus to degrade. Uh, you can then dispose it with your regular waste. In terms of laundry, um, uh, you know, don't go up in the morning and you know shake your duvet to to straighten it out because you know if if you got the virus, then obviously the virus sport, um, uh, could be sitting on that duvet. You just be creating this aerosol and spreading it around. Um, Dirty laundry can be washed in the same load, again, because of the soap and the high temperature um, that will kill off the virus. Obviously, if you've not got a washing machine, uh, you need to then wait for 72 hours after your isolation period has ended before then taking your laundry to the launderette. Things you can do, uh, obviously drink lots of water uh, to keep your urine a pale colour, and obviously you can take some the counter medication like paracetamol. Uh, there is uh, some uh, caution in terms of using uh, ibuprofen, uh, but if you're already on ibuprofen or anti-inflammatories for another illness, then the advice is that you continue taking that. If you're not already taking ibuprofen, then the advice at the moment is to take caution and not use it, even though actually there's no real evidence that it causes harm. But there's some anecdotal stuff there for advising just if you're not using it already, don't use it. If you have already been using ibuprofen and some other illness, then there's no harm in continuing. Obviously, you know, there's, there is a risk, as we, as we spoke about, over that 7 or 8 or 10, 12, 14 day period for people to become unwell. And, you know, people should seek help if they are becoming more unwell, especially if after seven days you're still having a fever or you're feeling really short of breath, you're finding it difficult to talk in full sentences, um, you're getting wheezy, uh, you should be definitely ringing uh, either one-on-one -on -one, uh, by telephone, or actually you might find it easier accessing one-on-one -on -one online, and there's the website oneonone.nhs.uk. Uh, obviously, if you don't have internet, then you need to ring one-on-one, -on -one. and if it's an emergency and you think, actually, I'm really struggling here, uh, I need an ambulance, then obviously ring 999, and inform them that you or a relative in your household has symptoms of coronavirus and then they will then take it from there. Um, you'll probably find that most of your medical and dental routine appointments have already been cancelled, but if they haven't, then you should be cancelling them if you're isolating. And obviously, if you're worried about the appointment or uh, it was something urgent, then make sure you do get in touch with the, uh, the, the, you know, the specialists are the numbers on your forms. Just a, a quick summary of things to, to do and not to do. Make sure you wash your hands often. You know, make sure you cover yourself if you're coughing or sneezing. There's, there's no recommendation to use face masks in the house. There's no evidence that that's going to reduce any transmission. 
obviously no visitors in the house and that shouldn't be the case anyway now uh, and there's no evidence that pets can be affected it's it's difficult being uh, isolated especially you know if you're if you're isolated in a room on your own because you're symptomatic um you know try and obviously keep in touch with your family and friends uh, there's lots of support uh, available online via the internet and there's a website called every mind matters um that's worthwhile um accessing and i'm sure the show are going to talk about some spiritual aspects and i think there is there is a is a blessing in the time as well uh, that you can use but you know keeping busy with other activities you know once you, if you're not actually isolating because you're symptomatic you may uh, decide to do some cooking reading online learning online uh, entertainment etc um obviously if you feel well enough and your symptoms are improving you can go out into your garden and take some light exercise but do remember and this is probably one that you know the psychologically something that really helps is that by staying at home you are you're not just staying at home for yourself you're staying at home for your community you're staying home for the well-being of your friends uh your extended family uh you know you're protecting the nhs we're, we're trying to stop it from getting overwhelmed um so if you bear that in mind that there's a there's a deeper more um spiritual significant reason for you staying at home hopefully that's enough to then uh, hang on to and continue through this so ending self isolation so this is a complicated bit and what I'm going to do is going to skip through all this um because it's easy to read through but I'm just going to come to this slide here so this um is a really good diagram by the BBC um so uh, describing or inform what to do if somebody becomes sick so mum she lives uh, you know with her family she becomes sick uh, so she is going to isolate for 7 days so that's day 1 all the way through to day 7 and then on day 8 her isolation if she is feeling better and her fever has settled down she can come out of isolation and she is then able to then uh, just go back to those kind of normal rules of staying at home and only going out to shop once a day or going out to to the chemist or whatever it is now if there's somebody living uh with her uh that other person so everybody else in the family now has to isolate for 14 days however if the other person who is living there becomes sick then actually they only need to isolate for 7 days because what we now know obviously if they've shown the symptoms after 7 days of showing symptoms it's unlikely that you're now infectious towards others so child number 1 here becomes unwell on day 3 so therefore after day 9 um i e 7 days of her isolation but in 9 days after the mother went into isolation the isolation then ends you then got child number 2 uh, or any person number 2 that person who shows no symptoms at all so that person has to remain in isolation for a total 14 days because as we said they could potentially at any point uh, be uh, be infected with the virus and not showing symptoms so if after 14 days of showing no symptoms I'm out of isolation um and the clock then resets and then finally you may have another person and actually all the way through up until day 13 day 14 they're not showing any symptoms on day 13 or day 14 they become symptomatic what happens is their day 7 of isolation then starts from that day so even though they've been isolating since day 1 when mum they continue now until they finish their 7 day isolation so potentially somebody could be in household isolation for you know 20 or 21 days in total and this is where the complication is so it's quite a uh, it's a this is probably one of the better representations that I've come across trying to explain this in terms of the isolation requirements 
obviously at the moment, even after isolation, we are pretty much isolated, but there are obviously things you can do um, that you wouldn't be allowed to do if you're isolating. Um, obviously at the end of the 14 day period, uh, any member of the family who hasn't become unwell can end household isolation. Uh, if somebody is ill and they're not showing any signs of improvement, they need to get in touch with uh, one on one. Um, and uh, obviously the, the other thing is the cough can persist for several weeks um, for some people. Um, and just because they've got a persistent cough after seven days doesn't mean that they need to continue isolating. Only if they've got a fever, they should be isolating, con uh, continue to isolate. And if they have got a fever after seven days, then actually they should, probably should be getting some medical advice as well. So we're just coming on to the final section, and that was the most complicated section on shielding. Um, so this is a, a, an additional a mechanism measure that was brought in uh, to protect those people who are extremely vulnerable. So we've got those people who are either over 70, under 70 with a long-term condition, um, or we've got uh, women who are pregnant. Now these people are people who have received an organ transplant, um, who have cancer and undergoing active chemotherapy or radiotherapy, um, or they've got some form of blood cancer such as um, severe respiratory problems, so cystic fibrosis, really severe asthma, severe COPD, um, and people at risk of rare diseases. Uh, if you're you know, on immunosuppressive therapy, so this could be uh, anything that increases the risk of infection. So um, you may have heard of medication like methotrexate and azathioprine and steroids, where they're dropping the immune system down. Uh, these type of people are at high risk if they, if they catch coronavirus uh, of having the, the, the severe complications. And then finally, for women who are pregnant, uh, who are known to have a significant heart disease, whether that, that's something they've acquired or whether it's congenital. And these people would have uh, and should have by now received either a message via their GP or a letter in the post advising them that they are uh, high-risk individuals and these people need to isolate so they need to take the household isolation route in terms of isolating themselves in their house for 12 weeks and that is a significant amount of time um, so they need to strictly avoid contact with anybody showing any possible symptoms of coronavirus uh, they should not be leaving their house even to go and do uh, uh, you know essential shopping or to the chemist um, they should absolutely not be attending any gatherings, even if it's in a, a private space. Um, uh, and again, like I said, they shouldn't be going out, doing shopping, travel. They shouldn't be uh, traveling to work. Uh, and, and what's uh, and the support that's going to be put in for these people and has already been put in is that communities uh, will be tasked with delivering food to them, delivering medication to them. So there will be support. Obviously, if somebody feels that they fit into this category, uh, either they've been told uh, and they're not feeling they're getting the support, then they really need to reach out to their GP, who will then be able to put them in, in contact with the right uh, facilities. Or if you feel that actually you or somebody you know should be shielding, but they've not been told to shield, then again, make sure you reach out to your GP uh, to, to get that further advice. And if you're living with somebody who is shielding because they are at high risk, then make sure you minimise, again, it kind of, it's a similar advice to whether you're living with a vulnerable person, but you want to minimise the time that you're spending in shared spaces. Try and keep that two metre distance. Um, if you can, obviously, use different, uh, different bathrooms. If you're sharing, make sure it's cleaned after each use. If you're sharing a kitchen, again, avoid using it whilst the, the shielding person there and again uh, taking your own meals back to your own rooms using a dishwasher etc so the advice is pretty much similar it's all about that distance uh, we know that um, so the two meter rule comes from uh, just through um, through some research and through some anecdote but it's about trying to spread that aerosol uh, air spread of, of the virus and then obviously the shared spaces the shared 
uh, kind of surfaces, etc. It's about reducing the spread through touch. Now, um, uh, in terms of maintaining mental well-being, um, especially now, you know, somebody who's going to have to spend 12 weeks at home is a, a very long time, and we're struggling with one week, two weeks, three weeks, but 12 weeks is significantly long. Um, so try and do some exercise at home, and I've just included some slides to so some really good, if you um, search for uh, NHS uh, exercises, there's some really good exercises for people of all abilities to do in their own houses. Um, and I'm more than happy to share the links. I'll just I'll share some, um, some, some pictures from that in the next slides. You know, try and spend time doing the things you enjoy. Um, try and eat healthily, well-balanced meals, lots of uh, water, um, you know, avoiding smoking and alcohol and drugs and all these kind of things. Um, try and get some fresh air into your room. You know, these are easy to say, but, you know, try and sit with a nice view if possible and get some natural sunlight. Obviously, for some people that's possible, for some it's not. But it's just trying to make the most of uh, what you've got. And you are allowed to go outside. You can go outside into your private space, into your garden. Um, but you, again, just remember that you need to stay two metres away from your neighbours and, and household members, uh, you know, if you're sitting on your doorstep or something. So we're not almost finished. We've just come to some simple exercises that I thought these were really good. And, um, and we could imagine, you know, a lot of our uh, sick uh, um, people who are, uh, high, you know, high-risk individuals. They tend to have uh, poor mobility. They probably don't think they could do much exercise anyway. But these are really good. So just sitting on a chair uh, and just bringing your arms out, so uh, straight up uh, up to your shoulders and even above your head if you can. Um, this one here is about crossing your arms over and then twisting around. Um, this here is just about lifting up your knees off the chair one at a time and then just doing these repetitive movements. Uh, and this one here is about actually just lifting your leg up straight and then just straightening and bending your ankle. So these are really, there's, I'm, I'm pretty much sure a lot of people should be able to do this. Uh, simple exercises. Uh, again, these are about just moving your arms up and down. Uh, moving your head uh, left to right, etc., and then just stretching out your your neck. Simple exercises that I think we should promote into all of our uh, vulnerable and high risk individuals, and especially our elderly. So there's a lot of evidence that we know that somebody who is housebound or is not spending much time going out and walking, uh, you quickly lose muscle mass, and by losing muscle mass, you then at higher risk of having other illnesses. For instance, you may find it difficult to balance yourself and then there's a risk of falls. So we want to make sure people are staying active and doing some, some form of exercise. And as, as people feel more, you know, as better or uh, they want to more challenging, they can do these strength exercises. So just simple, getting it up and out of your chair and just repetitively doing that. So you might do it two, three, four, up to 10 times, maybe once or twice a day, uh, using the chair as a, as a support and doing some um, sort of mini squats. Again, really good, simple exercises. Again, depends on the ability and, and how well or unwell the person is, but they could definitely uh, try and build up to these. And then finally, there's some exercises here, just try and strengthen those, uh, the hips, leg muscles which are really important for balancing uh, again using the chair as support and trying to do these exercises i wouldn't suggest rushing into them if people are not confident but they can definitely try and you know stand with support and then try and just lift one leg slightly off the ground just you know a centimeter two centimeters just to try and start getting that kind of sense of standing on one leg and then they can build up to these uh, movements so uh, this guidance is based upon the government guidance, uh, which you can access uh, via this link. Um, I have got a, a, a reference uh, slide as well, which I'm more than happy to share. Um, obviously, this advice uh, you know we've put together uh, in, in good faith, and but in all instances, um, you know, people should be referring back to the full guidance. 
uh, because it is changing. So I originally wrote this, um, I think it was the 16th of March. We're now the 3rd of April and we're probably on the 3rd or 4th iteration already. So do refer back to the main guidance. Jazakallah Heron. Uh, be happy uh, if there's any questions to take and uh, go from there. Um, Jazakal um, uh, uh, a really well presented uh, talk, mashallah. Um, uh, as expected, mashallah, we've we've had a number of people uh, posting questions, so um, there are probably about a dozen or so. So if you can try and keep it brief, that'd be great. Uh, the answers that is, and and also the people who are posting questions, if you can post a very specific question specifically relevant to today's talk, that would be very helpful as well. So the first question here is uh, from Aisha. Uh, it says here, um, a newly pregnant woman, um, so, uh, one to two months. Do they need to stay in those three months? Um, and then basically, it's, it's an, uh, sorry, Dr. Uh, Saab, um, you were, you were breaking up. You didn't hear the question. Okay. Uh, I'll attempt uh, I think if you can just mute yourself while I'm asking uh, yeah. the question, that'd be great. Yeah, thank you. So, um, so newly pregnant woman, uh, so the question is from Aisha, a newly pregnant woman who is one to two months pregnant, do they need to shield themselves, so i.e. Uh, stay indoors for three months? Um, is that uh, what is the government's uh, guideline? So, um, so newly pregnant, uh, so you'd, uh, any pregnant lady would fit into the vulnerable category. So unless uh, they've got uh, either uh, a heart condition, um, then they don't need to shield. However, there is advice for pregnant women who are in their final third trimester about minimizing uh, their contact. So if you're working in say in a healthcare environment, and you're coming across, uh, potentially coming across patients, then there is advice that actually they should be taken off the frontline duties. So there's, so there's no shielding requirement just because you're pregnant, um, but you are counted as a vulnerable category. So if there's somebody in your household who is isolating with symptoms, then you absolutely need to uh, distance yourself from those people. But otherwise there's no uh, requirement to shield for the 12 weeks or uh, somebody who's pregnant without other medical problems. Thank you so much for that. So uh, we've had a couple of uh, similar questions. Um, so ordering from takeaway, um, can the virus linger on on takeaway boxes? Also a similar question about how long can the virus last for on a solid surface? Um, and then by that, what, what the person I think is referring to is uh, the handles and, and uh, that kind of surfaces. Yeah, so um, the takeaway question is a good one. Um, there's no, uh, there's, there's nothing to suggest because really anybody who is preparing food is required to follow certain food hygiene um, uh, sort of guidance. And if they are following that food hygiene guidance, then the chances of that food uh, carrying coronavirus should be virtually uh, non-existent. However, uh, there is a possibility, depending on either the hygiene practices of the place where the food is coming from, or even on the packaging, there is a possibility. Therefore, the recommendation is that, actually, if you are getting a takeaway, then there's, two, there's a couple of things you could do. One is make sure you transfer the food straight away out of the packaging into a into your own plate okay so you're not using the packaging uh, to eat from okay the second thing is that you may wish to uh, reheat the food in the microwave uh, is either one or two minutes and that would then uh, destroy any virus as well so there are there are things you can do uh, but there's no I wouldn't say that you know absolutely you cannot have any takeaway food but there are certain precautions you could take. And the most important thing I think you can do is just not use the packaging. And the second question about the surfaces. So again, this is all, this, this, this virus is new uh, and we're still learning. There's, there's people still doing studies. Um, so 
the the, there's there's different um, uh, theories um, and a lot um, essentially the easiest thing to assume is that a virus can live on a surface up to 72 hours especially if it's a, a metal surface so that's why it's really important for that regular cleaning and uh, hygiene uh, just to prevent the spread. Just like a little clear. Um, and, and the following questions basically are something that I come across uh, quite a lot actually. Um, so people's concern uh, trying to differentiate what would be an abnormal cough, like cough. Uh, uh, what, what they're trying to assert in here is the question is, is the cough similar to an asthma cough? If someone has a dry cough, um, is it safe for them to cook for the family? Uh, also, uh, what would um, be the definition of a persistent cough? Because as you, as you mentioned in the beginning of your talk, I think initially they said that um, a persistent cough would be defined as a cough that's lasting for an hour, for three hours uh, of the day. Uh, so that definition keeps on changing and it's causing a bit of a confusion for general public. So yeah, if you can kindly answer those, please. Yeah, so... Um... The cough, uh, because it is difficult for uh, anybody to distinguish um, whether they have got coronavirus or not, the simple advice is any person with any new cough, so, so this, is, uh, this is discounting those people who have had a cough ongoing for four weeks or they know that every night time they go to bed they get a cough that's been happening for a long time those are discounted or uh, you may even have uh, people who are um, who are asthmatic and they know that they they do get their wheeze uh, and occasionally they get a cough so you can almost discount those but anybody who gets a in particular about a new cough uh, then those are the ones that are being advised however mild it is even if it's just you know, once or twice a day you're coughing, but it's something that's new. You didn't have this last week. Uh, you've not had it before. It started now. You need to assume that actually it is coronavirus and take that isolation advice. So there's, um, and then the persistence of it, again, it, it doesn't really matter uh, because it's, it's all about the isolation. Obviously, you know, people want to know whether they've got coronavirus or not. At the moment, it's not possible because uh, only if you're needing to be admitted into hospital, you're being tested. Uh, in the future, at some point, there will be antibody testing uh, for, for the public where, you know, if you've had a cough and you want to know whether you've had coronavirus, that will be possible. Hello, here. Um... Right. I think it's more of a definition of fever. I mean, again, something that I've come across uh, as well. Uh, some people don't have thermometers, for example. Uh, what do you advise in that case? So you don't need to go out and buy a thermometer. If you've got one, that's very good. Uh, you know, temperature over 37.8 on your thermometer, count that as a fever. If you don't have a fever, then if you are, you know, everybody knows how the normal temperature is. If you are feeling hot, especially if you're hot on your chest uh, or on your back, uh, or if you're feeling uh, kind of sweaty, clammy, then it's possible that you've got a fever. So it's more now the advice is that if you feel hot, so if you feel feverish, then you say that you've got a fever. Again, because the variety of symptoms and the spectrum of the severity from being literally no symptoms to being extremely severe, uh, the, uh, the guidance is that we just, you know, you've got mild symptoms, assume you've got coronavirus, just isolate yourself. Excellent. Now, there have been uh, some studies um, which have suggested, again, I'm not too sure which, uh, which studies uh, the brother or sister is referring to, says that the symptoms can start up to three weeks after exposure. Is there any truth in that? So, uh, I don't know which study they're referring to. However, uh, like I said, there are some uh, certain cases where symptoms, yes, they did start, um, you know, even up to 27 days after exposure, I read one paper. But that, those are very rare. So we need to take into consideration 
what is the what's going to happen for the majority of the average people so we're looking at the the bell distribution uh, so you will always have people on the extremes who will have uh, symptoms uh, extremely late and you'll have people have you know they're exposed on day zero and they get symptoms on day zero but actually what we're finding is it's that bell distribution so it's people in the middle it's on around within the first 14 days of exposure they've had their symptoms so we know after 14 days the likelihood we're not saying it's impossible but the likelihood of them having it is very very slim if they had exposure and um, I hope uh, that satisfies uh, the brother or the sister who asked the question. Um, right, a couple of questions about the type of mask and whether it's needed when you go out. So uh, one of the sisters is asking, um, when I go running, um, come across a few people, try to stay away. I would want to wear a face mask, but it's, I find it difficult. Uh, apologies for that. I find it difficult to stay at home. Um, and cannot get my normal exercise. So would you advise uh, to wear a face mask when running? I know, I think you touched it initially, but I think lately there has been some advice about um, using face mask. Um, uh, so, so I think there's some confusion around that. Um, uh, secondly, there is another question. Are you supposed to wear a normal mask um, or are you supposed to be wearing an N95 mask? Perhaps it's linked to the first question as well. Okay, so... There, there's no guidance to say that uh, wearing a face mask in the general public, in when you're out and about, that that's going to change your uh, risk of either transmitting or um, uh, catching coronavirus. So that's the first thing. You people are allowed to go and exercise if you're going out running, as long as you're keeping that two meter distance from other people or you're going out and running in an open area, there's absolutely no harm in doing that. And even if you're, you're, you're running past somebody, uh, you know, just, just either come to the side. So we've got to be pragmatic about this. Um, so it, it's, there's no hard and fast rule, but what we do know is that you don't need to be wearing a mask when you're out and about. That's what the current evidence is. Now in, ter time, in, ter in terms of types of masks, there is clear evidence if you work in an environment where there is a risk to you, for instance, in healthcare, there's a lot of discussion at the moment in, in terms of giving also to uh, the dead body, etc. There is some very specific guidance. Uh, it's just come out yesterday uh, from Public Health England uh, in terms of the types of masks to wear. Uh, but the important thing is that if you do wear an N95 or uh, the other types of more specific masks, then you need to ensure that those masks fit you properly and you've had a fit test because if it's still leaking air in and out, then it's not actually going to stop you from catching or passing it. Right now, this one is a very difficult one. How long, how long do you anticipate uh, these guidelines are gonna stay for? Um, yeah, I, I can't answer that. Uh, wallahu alam is all I can say. Um, I can only um, hope and pray that actually it doesn't go on forever. Um, but, you know, if we're the initial, um, I, I can't even speculate. I mean, we don't know where we're at. We don't even know for sure whether we've been in isolation for long enough even to have had that impact. We're going to see that impact, inshallah, over the next week, two weeks, we'll know whether the, the, there's been absolute true benefit of social isolation, social distancing. Uh, but we do know that if we come out of it too soon, then there's a risk that actually all the good work that's been done will just spark it all off again. So um, for, I can't answer that question, I'm afraid. But, it, you know, we, we are all worried. We should all be praying that, inshallah, this comes to an end as quickly as possible. Allah, inshallah. Um... Right, I think this is more uh, antibody testing question. So, is your antibody test be positive? Is your antibody test supposed to be positive if you are a symptomatic coronavirus carrier? I think that's what she's trying to say. So, what, let me rephrase it. I think what she's trying to say here is, um, someone who has been exposed to the coronavirus um, can an antibody test um, reassure that person that now they can't have the virus again. 
So theoretically, um, when we are exposed to a new um, foreign uh, you know, virus or anything like that, your body will create a, an immune response where it will go and fight that virus because it recognizes it being a foreign uh, organism inside your body. And then what it does is a, uh, a kind of a, a copy of that um, uh, code is kept and stored so that if you're then exposed to that again in the future, uh, those cells come out and they're able, they know exactly which type of um, uh, proteins, etc., that need to go and fight that virus. And they're called antibodies. So theoretically, if somebody is exposed to coronavirus and uh, inshallah they recover, then they would have developed some antibodies to that coronavirus. And that should then stop them from catching in the future. And that's what these tests are trying to measure is the presence of those antibodies. Now, there is some research and some evidence that uh, some people who have a mild illness or who do not show any symptoms, there's a possibility that they're not mounting a big enough immune response to actually have these kind of more permanent copies of these antibodies. Therefore, there's a risk that actually, if they've been exposed to it, they could potentially be exposed to it again uh, and, and succumb to it again. So there's a possibility of that. But also, there's a possibility that they've been exposed to it, they produce some antibodies, but now those antibodies are not detectable with these tests, but they're still immune. So it's a very um, unclear picture at the moment because the tests are all very new um, and they're being brought in very quickly. And it's only with... Uh, um, uh, you know, extensive testing um, and analysis that will have an absolute idea of how effective these are in te telling you whether you've had it or not. Exactly. Okay. Um, right. Uh, it's a question about symptoms, really. Are there any other possible symptoms that haven't been mentioned? Um, I think there has been a talk about anosmia and things like that. Uh, do you want to touch on those? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, there is this, uh, again, anecdotal at the moment. So people with a loss of smell and a loss of taste uh, as being the initial symptoms of uh, coronavirus. Um, it's not been included in the absolute kind of list of symptoms yet. Uh, but again, like I said, we're still we're still learning about this disease. So um, so if, if somebody does experience loss of smell and loss of taste uh, with for no particular other reason they've not got any other uh, coexisting infection then they should uh, probably seek if they're not 100 percent sure seek some medical attention uh, medical advice while one 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 who can then talk you through and see if you do have um, possible coronavirus but yeah there's a whole variety and just you know going back to that symptom list the problem is that these symptoms mimic um, are pretty much the same as um, a flu and a common cold, although you're less likely to get runny roses and that kind of thing, but you can still get headaches, sore throats, body aches, um, uh, you know, feeling breathless. But we know the main two symptoms are, in fact, main three, you could say is a fever, cough, and the breathlessness. So if you get those three or any one of those three, then it's highly likely. But if you're getting any others, then you know then you, you may just need to have to presume that you have got coronavirus. Okay, I think we answered um, all the questions by the attendees. Um, so um, my question time now to you, Dr. Ali. Um, so um, how is it going in your area? I mean, we are thinking of having some um, hot hubs uh, for uh, you know for for the primary care. Uh, to deal with the situation better. Uh, is that something which is in the pipeline uh, in your area? Absolutely. Um, so I've been working on um, sort of coronavirus advice lines. And, you know, what I've noticed is that um, there are a lot of patients uh, with, um, you know, they're quite unwell and we're, we're keeping them at home as, as best as possible. Um, and, but also, 
and there is some kind of uh, uh, hopefully uh, optimistic uh, evidence showing that there is uh, that there is a slight contraction, but um, but you know this it is and it's very busy, very very busy, which is why it's really important we do not, you know, as Boris Johnson keeps saying, do not take your foot off the gas pedal. You know, I was uh, I had to uh, go out this eve this afternoon, and in a way it was good. There were not many cars around, but actually there's still a lot of people out and about. Uh, in twos and threes and fours in their cars, and so it's, it's quite um, disheartening actually. And and I, I give the um, story of my son who who was in. I say he was the first place in our family. He had a cough. He's twelve years old. He stayed in his room for a whole seven days. Not once did he complain. Not once did he say he wanted to go outside or go downstairs. He went his room, bathroom, room. That was it. And he knew that it, he's a 12 year old, he can understand the, the significance of, you know, if this was passed on to somebody else in our household, our parents, God forbid, you know, he can understand it. So I think, and he can take it seriously, then there's no excuse for anybody else not to take it seriously. It's a really, really pertinent advice. And, um, Certainly, I've seen uh, a lot more people become serious and take it more seriously, but you do occasionally see people, unfortunately, who are still taking it quite lightly. So very, very pertinent indeed. Um, one more question on, um, especially for people who are um, self-isolating, um, especially in the healing category for three months, that is a long time, isn't it? Um, is it really practical? <sighs> It is a very long time. Um, it, I can't answer that question really in terms of practicality. Uh, it, I don't think there's any choice. Um, so, it, you know, there's there's advice there in terms of things people can do, but I think it's really difficult for some people to stay indoors uh, even for more than a day. Um, and it's going to be a huge challenge for those people, um, but but it's our duty as medics, uh, you know, your, your scholars, um, other people in the community, to to provide that advice to drive home the point that actually, you know, what you're not just doing this for yourself; you're doing this for other people. You're doing this for your family. You are not only protecting yourself. This is there is an Islamic uh, kind of perspective to this. Uh, there are there's there's a reward for you know uh, staying in isolation and being patient about it and expecting that reward. So if we can get those messages across to people and hopefully make it easy for people, obviously it, it becomes impractical uh, staying at home for twelve weeks. But um, we need to make use of what we've got. There's a lot of technology, you know, just being able to do these uh, video uh, conferences. Uh, consultations, speaking to your friends. I think, you know, if we've got, uh, especially people who may not be aware of how to use computers or tablets, you know, trying to demonstrate to them in a, in a sort of socially distanced way how to have a video consult with their, uh, with their friend who they may be used to seeing every single day uh, rather than just being on the phone, show them how to use the, the video function, FaceTime or WhatsApp or whatever it is, allow them to experience these technologies as well so they don't feel completely cut off. Absolutely. So, I mean, the main thing oh. perhaps is that you know, we are advising them to cut off from the rest of the world but just to keep that distance um, in China. And as, as you rightly said, especially uh, in a country like UK, uh, where you do have internet access pretty much all over the country, really, and really good connections as well. Um, one question has just been posted by Yusuf. I think this will be the last question for today's talk. Why most or all the doctors uh, that have passed away are Muslims? And I think if I'm right, um, there have been five uh, Muslim deaths so far, uh, Muslim doctors' death, and one nurse who passed away in early hours of the morning today. May Allah have mercy on them. I mean, um, I can't speculate. I can't say... 
why. I just think it's, uh, um, you know, there's, there's, there should be no reason why. Uh, there's obviously a high proportion of um, uh, sort of immigrants or uh, you know, people who have come from who migrated to the country, uh, health workers in the NHS anyway. So it, you know, it is likely that we will see people from from those backgrounds passing away. Unfortunately, um, I wouldn't like to speculate or say that there's any other kind of reason for this. Um, other, other than that, I think there's just obviously there are a lot of Asian, a lot of Muslim, a lot of immigrant workers in the NHS. Therefore, we're going to see those numbers anyway. Well, Allah have mercy on their souls. I mean, it's a, anybody who, who is fighting and who is uh, out there uh, seeing these patients and, and dedicating their lives. I mean, they, they, it doesn't matter who they are, uh, they, they deserve full, full credit. Indeed, they do. Uh, may Allah help them all. Absolutely. I mean, he is now volunteer to go to Lincoln Hospital and stay there for eight weeks, and he will be looking after just the COVID ward. Uh, so to to leave his family away for two months, to be in the front line essentially like a soldier. So it's it's mashallah amazing, really, how people are mashallah taking it. And, and coming to the front when, when you're really required. So with that, uh, we'll uh, come to the end of our talk. Jazakallah uh, khair, Dr. Adman Ali, for spending your time and giving us your precious advice. That's okay. Jazakallah. Thank you very much for allowing me to duty as well. Jazakallah khair. So just for us and uh, people who joined in, we've got uh, another lecture, second of the series planned for tomorrow, same time, uh, 8 um, p.m. UK Standard Time. Thank you so much, uh, Brother Adnan. Uh, it was uh, really good, mashallah, having you today. And I've not met you before. No, no problems. Thank you very much for inviting me. It's been really, uh, it would be useful to, to get some feedback and um, uh, to see what people uh, thought about. And I'm happy to share the slides with you and I can share you some uh, resources as well if you want to send them out to people. I'm absolutely yeah, there, 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 been, there been a few people asking for slides, so that'd be yeah. great. Thank you so much. You take care of yourself. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Take care.